no matter the version of Bible you're using. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 8 is the 10th book of the Bible, am I right? Chapter 9, verse 6. Look at what God said here. I will build up gradually. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded that you should do. And the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. Let me run to the last two verses. And verse 23 and 24 of chapter 9. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. Verse 24. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar. What and what? The burnt offering. Take note number two. The fact. And when that happens, what follows? When the people saw this, the Bible said they did what? And what followed when they shouted? When the glory manifests before a man, no man can stand before his glory. No man. But what happened before this event? I don't want to read from verse 7 down. But I'll just give a summary of verse 7 to verse 22. What happened? Let me just show you in chapter 16 so that we leave Leviticus alone. Chapter 16. Let me read verse 2. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, and he came not at all times into the holy place within the veil before what? Before what? Before what? Listen to that word. Which is upon the hark which that he died not. For I will appear in the cloud. Where? No, upon, upon where? Mercy. Upon where? Mercy. I don't know why God is emphasizing mercy, mercy, mercy. Ah. Ka, 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 ka. Look at what he said. He said, I will appear upon thy mercy seats. Let me run. Verse 10. No, verse 11. And then I shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is first of all for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself, and go on to verse, verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon where the mercy seat is one. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. And when he does that, the Bible says that in verse if you read down, the Bible says that the, 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 the glory will now come upon the mercy seats. If the glory that drives change comes upon the holy seats, no man can approach his presence. No man can encounter the God of change. But God said the glory will drop on the mercy seat. We used to look at mercy as one weak virtue. When we hear the word mercy, the first thing that comes to us is one weak virtue. But look at the writings of Paul. There is no church he wrote to that did not pray for grace and mercy upon you. All through the epistles, he will say, as he's beginning the epistle, he writes with the word mercy. As he's ending, he ends with the word mercy. May the grace, may the mercy of God rest upon you. Amen. Without his mercy, you can't see the glory. Amen. That's why God did not present himself on the holy seat. He said, no, it's upon the mercy seat. That the glory, that the cloud will sit upon. And there are some of you who are seated before me this morning. That needs to encounter that mercy. No matter how long your life has been. No matter how much you have been battered, no matter how much more the devil has run riot upon your system, there is a place for mercy for you. Amen. No matter how distance you have gone from your creator, no matter how much you think, can I also be called among the sons of Levi? You look through your life, you are tormented by your yesterday, you are chained by your present life. You are hooked up to things that does not profit God and profit you. There is the mercy seat for you. God wants to begin from that point when he wants to show you his glory and change your life. 
I want you to bow your heads. Let's pray. I want you to get yourself ready. How far have you come from God? What is the distance between you and God? The mercy seat is available. Because I know that this meeting is designed for you and the place of glory is here. You want that recognition back into where you belong. You want God to embrace you. The prodigal son thought it was finished. But when he came back, the Bible said, when the father saw him afar off and presented the mercy seat and went and embraced him. And said, give him the choices of robe. Kill the fattest car for him. It is a time for change. You want to encounter God. You want to renew your commitment, your life unto God. I want to pray for you this morning. As I continue, so we can be on the same page as I continue my message. I just want you to place your right hand on your chest. I want to pray for you. Do me a favor this morning. Stand on your feet. I believe God has something tremendous for you. I believe God's presence is here for you. Oh, the steadfast love of our God never sees it. His mercies has never come to an end. The songwriter says, there are new every money. There are new every money. Great is thy faithfulness. We come out to the mercy seat, not to the holy seat. We approach the place of mercy, where you will encounter us and show us your glory. This morning I pray for every son and daughter standing before you. I ask that God, as they ask for that mercy, provide it for them. Provide it for them. Reach unto them. Make something new out of their life. As they recognize the place, they say, Lord, I want to walk with you afresh. I want to stand in this place of glory and pursue you like never before. I want to embrace this grace like never before. By reason of this convention, this conference, I want to stand in the place of mercy to start a fresh walk with you in the second day of April. 17, I ask, oh God, the God of mercy, show the mercy in the name of Jesus. Let I count on you in the place of mercy in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Be seated. I will begin this morning again by telling you, God said something in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I want to read from verse 8 to 11. Say, there's a time to love and a time to hate. A time to walk, a time of peace. What profit are he that walketh in the world in the laborate? He said, I have seen the trouble which God had given to the sons of men to be size in it. In the verse 11, he said, he had made everything. Some things. No, no, look at your own Bible. What did he say? Some translation says, all things beautiful in my time. No, in my time. You don't understand. He said, he had made all things, everything beautiful in my own time. And look at what he says. Run down to verse 14. So I don't take much of the time. He said, and I know because God is interested in making everything beautiful and bringing a change upon my life, he said, I know that whatsoever God doeth, he said, it shall be forever. Nothing shall be put to it. Not anything taken from it. Why? Because God does it. When God is involved in a man's life, nothing can change it. This morning I will share with you four things that can expedite, can dry change into your life. Very quickly I will share those things with you. I will be running at the speed, so just bear with me. Follow me as I begin. Number one thing I want you to understand that change for a man's life begins from the place of 
sacrifice. I am a witness, a testimony for it. Every change you see, you want to thrive in this life. There must be a place. I don't want to go to Leviticus. You must come to the point of placing the sacrifice on the altar. No change approach the man when the man is not ready for a sacrifice. I'll just share a small story with you. Second Kings chapter 3. Let me just share that story so I can run. Verse 27. Second Kings chapter 3, verse 27. I will take it from verse 26. When God establishes covenant with his people, in most cases he calls them to sacrifice. When Jesus was to be an instrument to drive change, what did he do? He laid his life as a sacrifice. The inner nation of Moab was unused, was unused, was in pain. And they needed their story to change. Verse 26 says, And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too difficult for him, was too difficult for him, he says, the Bible says, he took with him, first of all, 700 men that the best of the best, the brigade of gods. He took them with him so that he would do what? That the first time that word, that word we use in our circle today. To do what? And you can pronounce the word to do what? Say that word again. The way you say it will determine the amount of breakthrough you have. Say it again. How many of you need breakthrough? I don't think so. I have four children. <laughs> Small old man, four children. My son is in the university. Your boy, Israel, written architecture. Your products, <laughs> the building industry. <laughs> <laughs> in the next three weeks, we'll be done with his hundred level, and it's not yet sixteen. My daughter, well, the first person who took me into the state house, she plays violin. She has played with Kennelly in his church in the city of Abuja. I'm coming somewhere. Things does not just happen. Mm. There are sacrifices we make. Hey. I tell my friends that at the age of five, every child that comes out from my loins, Sakatampaya, must learn an instrument of music in God's house. Mm. My boy plays the guitar. I don't play the violin. The small one. She's playing the drum now. The boy who is seven is contending also to play the drum now. It's a principle, it's a policy that at the age of seven, you must learn a foreign language. Kahuta, Kras, Kahuta, Legedea. So they score the best in French. French is the language that is closer to the part of the world I came from. We're in the West African region, surrounded by about eight or nine Francophone countries. So I said, learn it. Just in you know, raising children. I don't know why God is leading me there. But they literally make a sacrifice for their future. If you don't sit to deliberately stand, you will change the next generation. You cannot. It is intentional. It is things I pursue passionately. Nothing can stop me. I can sell this garment to fulfill those dreams for those children. They came through my loins. They must be greater than me. Yeah. Listen to me this morning. God has a plan for you and your family. God plan of a plan for even that child. You think he's not making it away. And the instruments began to play on his own accord. Music. 
Kikidia. What sacrifice can you give to God? In these three areas of your treasure, your time, your talent. Number two, one thing that I need to skip that you need to do to accelerate, to expedite a change of story is that you need to refocus. Tell your neighbor, refocus. <laughs> you see, when people start something new, many cases they stay focused. But somehow along the way, they lose their focus. The Galatian church, Galatian church was like that. And Paul wrote to them in Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. They were very focused church, doing very well. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul spoke to them. You see, there are many of you who start very well. He said, you did run well. You did start well. He said, who did hinder you? Along the process that you should no longer obey the truth. There are people who start the year with a focus. I want to lose two pounds. I want to lose ten pounds. <laughs> no, I'm not speaking your mind. <laughs> they said all those things. The measure of your growth is not, I think I'm sharing some weight. The measure of your growth is climb the scale. <laughs> the measure of your growth is check the belt hole if you're a guy. <laughs> it's not feeling, it's not your feeling. It's like I'm losing some, or I'm trying. No, no, no. Climb the scale. Let me show you whether you are trying or not. They start very well. Every hour they are there in the gym. They are trying to pull some off hearts off. But along the process, who did you start it well? Who did hinder you? Kahita Gama to Remaskaha. Who did hinder you? And in fact, the next verse, he told them, he says, look, he says, a little living, living the whole law. What is a living? A dough. You know, it appears as if it's big, but it's empty inside. Five enemies of focus in every man's life. Number one is distraction. When people, when other things become priority in your life, what you spend your time most on with, becomes your priority. When other things become priority in your life, distraction is what? An enemy of focus. People won't want to change their focus. Somebody defined a focus man as a blind man. He doesn't see anything. Listen to me. You want a change in your life. Tell your neighbor, be focused. Number one enemy of the of focus is what? Distraction. When other things that, and that's why he said, you started well. What did hinder you that you should not obey the truth anymore? What came in between? You worked well. You chose your relationship well. But along the process, somebody, one kind of friend that helped not to be a friend, mingled their life into your life. And your life is becoming like, Adding to touch. Listen to me. I tell people when I preach, I say friendship is by choice. Yeah. <laughs> it's not by force. It's by what? I chose who can be my friends. <laughs> Those who I don't want to be my friends, I define the borders and the boundaries. Politely, I define it. Who did hinder you? Who is distracting you? Who is shifting you away from your true story? Who is making you to walk in the shadow instead of the reality? There are certain relationships that you need to break by reason of this year's meeting. Yeah. By reason of this year's meeting, there are certain things you need to stop. Yes, Who told you you can't stand over habits? Habits are formed. They are not shut up. You cannot do habits. There are certain habits in life you need to stop. When I was to build my first house, I started. What came to my mind was to build a duplex. And some people came and said, ah, people were my senior. Why do you want to build a duplex? But not just a duplex, a twin duplex. And they were wondering, why do you want to build a duplex? They were my senior. When I look at their resources, it is bigger than mine. But I was determined. When I came back from burying my father-in-law, 
And I went into that place and God said, this is the place, it belongs to you. I knelt down and held his hand and said, this is mine. And I started from that day. They said, it's easy to build a bungalow. Both of you know what I'm talking about. You are in that industry. <laughs> it's like it's easy to build a bungalow. I agree with them. They said, because Deki, the money for Deki. You know, they build all kinds of, all kind, all kind of fear in your mind. But we started. We started. We completed both of them at record time. When we moved in, that was when some people began to think I can also do it. You share them story. <laughs> you see, it, it takes a man of focus and said, This can be done with God. He blesses the fruit of our labor, the works of our hands. He provides for us. The psalmist says, since I was young, and now I am growing old, I've never seen the Lord forsaking the righteous. Nor is seed begging bread. It is a reality. Distractions came along the road. For some of my friends who were very close to me, we talk and talk about real estate investment. I had to cut them off. Because for every encounter I had with them, there were stories of discouragement. There were stories that uh, uh, this project is too big. There were stories that were not fine. So I practically draw the line, pull the boundaries, and say, enough is enough. Yes, Number two, enemy of focus is disorder. It is uh, when we lack discipline. We close our lives and we're not able to align our life properly. It's amazing how much we collect each year. Yet when we check, sometimes at the end of it, we make evaluation. Bishop Edipo used to say, so many houses that people have built is in their stomach. <laughs> so many great factories people have started is in their handbags. <laughs> you must learn to order your life and align your life with your purpose of existence. Mm. But it's really a pity that you don't even understand your purpose of existence. Then how can you align? Mm. Many lives are in disorder, so their stories cannot change. Until you put your life back to order, that is when your story will change. Mm. Number three, let me run. It's when Christians when we experience delays. When things don't happen fast enough, we lose focus. Car heater. Am I right? Yes. Am I speaking somebody's mind? Yes, sir. We lose focus. Somebody promised that in March he's going to give me two thousand dollars. March came and I departed. It's not going to be found. Then what happens to me? Because I've been delayed over. The enemy just come, comes in and he sows that seed, and I began to lose focus. I had forgotten that a thousand cattle upon the hills belong to God. <laughs> I forgot that. Number four enemy is discouragement. Hey, when we suffer setbacks, let me tell you, everybody suffers a setback in life. <laughs> ask the apostle, he will tell you. Ask Pastor Mrs. She will tell you. Ask everyone of God's servants, sit and they will tell you. <laughs> Discouragement comes in life. So now later something is going to hit you. It jumps out. It just comes out on you. What do you do in life? Most things don't work according to plan. Most things don't work according to plan. People forget about the great thing and feed on discouragement. They forget about the dream. Forget about where they are going and they feed on discouragement. Number five enemy. Talk. Focus is where people begin to doubt. When we think we are not capable, we doubt ourselves. You can't accelerate change. You can't bring forth change to your story when you have been, 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 been you know, visited by these five factors. You begin to doubt yourself. The good news is that this is a new quarter. Yeah. The good news is that you need to refocus your lenses of life. Amen. That's why this meeting is called. I just shared this story with you, Mark 8, 22 to 25. Mark 8, 22 to 25. And they came to Bethsaida, Mark 8, 22 to 25. And some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spat on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? 
And he looked up and said, I see men as what? As trees. <laughs> then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again. And he opened his eyes. The sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. Listen to me. Look at the three conditions of this man. They may not be far from your condition. Number one, the man has no vision. <laughs> when you have no vision for your life, other people are going to leave you. You're going to be led by the hands of others. Your time, money, and led by other people because you have no vision. Some of you, your resources are being controlled by others because you have no vision. When I started working somewhere some, some years ago, I just discovered that over 80% of my earnings are being demanded by others. And one day I just asked myself, if I continue like this for the next five years, will I be able to keep landmarks? They will ask me, I've stayed in Texas for 10 years. What can I show for it? Because demands will come, especially for us who are from the developing nations. They will demand, they will call, they will ask. And I just put an analysis and said, come on. 80% of my income is being demanded by people. The two of these are the same people that will laugh at you. Yeah. He spent all these years in the city of Austin. He spent all these years in Dallas. What can he show for? Because the day of reckoning will come before he even die. <laughs> so I just went and said, look, no. When people become the controller of your resources, you have no vision. If you see it as a problem, then it hurts you. Then you approach it with tenacity to solve the problem. And these are realities of life. Am I speaking to somebody? Yes. If I stop you, are you blessed? Yes. Have I spoken to your heart? Yes. Listen, the material problem of this man. The condition of this man is that he now had the clear vision. It's when you see things the way they should be, that your vision becomes clear. How do you see things in life? How do you see things in life? You must see things the way God has spoken them to be. Until you begin to see things in that direction, you may not be able to move. Focus is more deciding what you cannot do than what you will do. Let me round up with number three. What time is up? <laughs> Let me round up with the, the third one. I want to just read the story of this man I love so much. The story of the man in the book of Genesis. Can you get Genesis in New Testament? No matter how much Bible school you attend. Genesis, let me round up with the story of Genesis 27. Yes, 27. I don't want to jump into all. So you permit me to end up with this one. Genesis 27. From verse 31. I'll just pick some few verses. I'll make up something there. 31 years. Is that? No, 32. Genesis 37, 27, 32. Is that the right place? Holy Spirit, yes. That is it. And Isaac, his father, said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. At this point of this man's life, he has lost his place for destiny. He has sold his portion of destiny with his bowl of soup. He was an irresponsible young man. He was careless. He said, what will it profit me, this thing you call firstborn? He forgot that in the culture of his days, he is to be an inheritor of his father's greatness. Not just an inheritor, a double portion of his father's greatness. He has been lost from, when I read this verse of scripture, it means there was no connection anymore. There is no way you will go to a class of unbred students and let all of them answer to Bori 
or you speak and call to her that she will not recognize her father's voice. There is a link. But at this point, there was no link anymore. His father said, Who had thou? He has to reintroduce himself. He said, I am thy son. I kaha to ya. In other words, at this point, the link between sonship and fatherhood has been broken. He said, I am thy son. Not only am I your son, but I'm also your firstborn. And my name you gave me is Esau. Listen, verse 33. I is it trembled, have I said, said, Let me leave that place. And it went on. In verse 34. After his father has told him, I have, look at what he said in verse 9. I is it trembled, very said, Who? Where is, who is it that has come and brought this for me? And I've eaten of him and I've blessed him. Yes! He shall be blessed. Verse 34. And when he saw how the words of his father. He cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me also, O oh my father. Bless me also, O oh my father. When you read earlier on in verse 36, look at what he said. He said, he said, it is not the right name Jacob, he's a supplanter. He said, he has deceived me two times, took my back right. He had taken away my blessing. Mm. I disagree with the assertion of Esau. Jacob didn't take his back right. Mm. He gave his yeah. back right. Yeah. Let me tell you something you will take home. Put it down somewhere. In memory, you write it. Never you negotiate when you are hungry. Never you negotiate anything in life from the point of hunger. I have sat in boards in council to employ people, to interview people. And many times when people come to me and I ask them the simple question, what can we offer you as a monthly emolument? They said anything. The moment you say anything, you can't pass that interview because you don't have worth and value for yourself. Most of those people, after three, four months, six months of work, they become unproductive. Because when you give them the edit, you see, we are all capitalists by nature. We want to maximize profit and minimize cost. When you give them the anything they say, after two, three months, the anything cannot even cover their house rent, their transport, their feeding and they become unproductive to the environment. They become what we call, in the world of human resources, we call them pure. Hmm? Previously unidentified recruitment errors. And they become problem to your organization. Even in church, when you recruit people to work for you, they become what? Pure. Previously unidentified recruitment errors. You can't sack them, they are there in the system with you. They are not productive, they are complaining. So that was the choice. Never you negotiate from the point of hunger for anything in life. Even when you feel that you are say it, speak forth to yourself. Go with dignity. Stand with your value. Tell them what you, before you pick up any job, make a research of what is being paid in the industry. Don't just walk God and say, my previous pay was uh, this, so I can take this, I can manage with this. Don't be so desperate. Many of us are negotiating out our bad rights. Mm -hmm. Like Esau. And we think we are far from Esau. He said, Esau gave it, not Jacob took it. Listen to me. But the story I want to draw for us to pray. Look at what he said in verse 8. 38, and Esau said unto him, Father, that's our prayer point, as thou but one blessing, do you have the amplified version? Some version says, do you still have one blessing remaining? 
Just one blessing. He came in the spirit of this sacrificial woman. That even the crumbs that falls from the master's table, the dog do it. He said, do you have but one blessing? And Jesus said, has thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even also bless me. Oh, my father. And the Bible says, he wept. Look at verse 39. And the father, Isaac, his father, answered him and said, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the heads. It sounded well, am I right? And of the dew of heaven from above. It sounded well, am I right? Now, what the resources of the head, natural resources will favor you, will bless you. I will put favor upon you. But look at what the father concluded in verse 40. He said, By your sword you shall live. You shall be a warrior, a fighter. But look at what the father says. And with all these things, what was the conclusion of the father? He said, And thou shalt serve thy brother. Is that a blessing? Ibrahim to Tuma. Is that a blessing? No. You know what? I will give you food you will eat. I will cover you. You will fight and win wars. But what will you be? A servant to you, your brother. But look at that verse 40 because we're going to pray. Celebrate your greatness. Number one, I said, is what? Your sacrifice. Number two, what did I say? Be focused. Be focused. And number three, you must be restless. Look at what the father said. Any other translation, verse 40. Anybody can read for me. And my son shall live, and thou shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass. That's the meat for prayer. It shall come to pass when thou shalt become restless. 